I'm sure this is one of the key sessions that everyone is waiting for. Um, and it gives me immense pleasure to welcome a true pioneer of the Indian startup ecosystem um, and someone who needs no introduction. Um, and uh, so, so thank you for taking your time uh, to be part no, of. Thank you for calling me. And you know, I'm a bit of a dinosaur. Uh, I was sitting here for the last 20 minutes listening to the earlier panel, and I was learning so much that I didn't know. So thank you for calling me. That's that's great to hear. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, and, and look forward to some pretty good um, insights. Um, and hopefully, I mean, it would be very helpful, uh, especially I think there's been a lot of changing times right now in the overall Indian startup ecosystem with a lot of focus on profitability and a lot of uncertainty. So I think uh, your session would be very valuable. Um, so so, so uh, to start with, Sanjeev, I think you founded InfoEdge Group and uh, in the early days of the Indian startup ecosystem, right, in, or rather internet ecosystem. Um, and can you share some insights into probably the challenges uh, during those formative years? Okay, and, so. And how they shaped your approach to entrepreneurship? Yeah. Sure. Uh, so, InfoEdge has existed as a business since 1989 90, right? Uh, in the beginning, it was a partnership firm, then a proprietorship, then it became private limited. And the entity that exists today, the private limited company, we became public. Uh, but InfoEdge, so for the first seven years, I quit my job in 1990 and became an entrepreneur. I had no big idea. I had no vision. Uh, I just didn't want to work any longer uh, as an executive in a, a multinational corporation rising up the ranks. I wanted to do something different. So for the first seven years, we drifted and did a bunch of small things. Salary surveys, uh, trademarks database, uh, some reports, uh, some teaching, some training, some writing, maybe 20 different things. And then in 1997, we launched Nokri as one more small idea. Uh, at that time, there were only 14,000 internet accounts in the country, uh, but it looked like a large enough number to me. Right? Uh, I felt if we can get uh, 500 companies every month, to pay 1,000 rupees to list a job on Nokri, we do 5 lakh rupees a month, and that'll be 60 lakhs a year. Uh, and the company till then was doing about 15 or 12 lakhs a year, so it would be 5x. And I said, if you can do that in three years, that'll be huge success. Right? Because we can make a profit, I can take a salary. So in the first 10 years, for roughly six or seven years, for seven years, I could not take a salary. Because so salary, I, I take a salary sporadically, right? And I would teach on weekends at business schools in and around Delhi to earn some pocket money to survive, right? Uh, so this looked like a ticket to a steady income to me, uh, a nifty small idea. Ki agar 5 lakh rupees turnover hoga mahine ka, to shayad uh, you know ek do ek lakh profit ban jayega mahine ka, and I can take a salary. Uh, as things turned out, you know the the internet grew. Uh, right place, right time, worked hard, worked smart, got, luck, you know, got lucky, God was kind, whatever. Uh, the internet just exploded. And after bootstrapping Nokri for three years, uh, so the first three years we had to break even to survive. Right? There was no money, so you have to break even. Uh, we raised venture capital in April 2000 from ICICI Venture and we got really lucky. Uh, we were the second last dot com in India to get funded in that era because uh, we raised money at a bubble valuation and the market melted down two weeks later. So we didn't have time to spend the money foolishly. Right? And we sort of put it in fixed deposit in the bank and we tore up our business plan and we said, this is the only money we'll get. Uh, and uh, we have to make a profit in this and turn it around. And we did that in three years. We made losses for two years, and then we broke even again. And we grew every year, and then we listed in 2006. So it was a tough, uh, I think, first 13, 14 years. Uh, first, there was no money. Uh, then there was some money, but it was a meltdown. Uh, and then finally, we turned it around, and uh, we were able to list the company. Got it. I think so. Basically, one key takeaway for me, I mean, uh, I've been also been part of uh, my own journey where I've gone through a lot of challenges initially. So it's like you, 
So be be at it if things if you see that there's a product market fit, be at it, and then over time as the basically the market grows, I think. Yeah, yeah and be frugal because you know you, the only thing you're in control of is your costs. Your revenues are not in your control. That depends on the market and the customer yeah. and the product market fit. But jo aapke kharche hain, yeah. that you're in control of. Uh, so be very, very, so if you're a bootstrapping entrepreneur, a bootstrap company, be very focused on your costs. Keep them under tight control. And, and one thing I've seen is like Delhi and CR companies are more frugal than Bangalore based companies. So, uh, <laughs> if you get too much money, too easily, uh, there's a tendency to spend it suboptimally. Right? So those of us who are bootstrap companies are probably very careful about how we spend the money. Those of us who are VC funded uh, are perhaps need to be less careful. And, and definitely very kind of relevant to the current uh, market scenario, right? And, and, and as you have seen, like since 2000s, the internal landscape has evolved significantly over the last 20 years. And how has like InfoEdge adapted to all these changing technology trends, market trends, and at what point kind of like did you venture into other verticals? I mean, which... I'll tell you. you see, there was a, up to a point I could understand most things that were happening, mm. right? But then things began to happen so fast and so differently that I figured that I can't keep track of everything. So we just have to hire great people, get great people on board, and they will lead the change because they will understand stuff. So right now I'm 60 years old. Uh, but the average age in the company is 25 or 26, and we have five and a half thousand employees. Uh, so a lot of the thinking, a lot of the ideas, a lot of the cutting edge stuff is done by much, much younger people. Uh, people who, who know more than me. People who are with the latest trends. You know, I barely use Instagram. I don't understand how I can market on Instagram. I mean, somebody you're pretty it. active on Twitter these days. So. <laughs> I have been a little active on Twitter, yes. Uh, so Twitter, I understand and like. <laughs> Got it. So, like, at what point, like, is you, I mean, as InfoH thought about kind of venturing into those verticals? So and, I'll tell you. And, and maybe what is the driver? So, I'll tell you. See, uh, we first did Nokri. Uh, and then, uh, in 98 December, we launched Jeevan Sathi as one more thing to do. But we didn't put any resources behind it. We just floated it into the free site. When ICICI Venture invested in uh, uh, InfoEdge in April 2000, they said, what is this, Jeevan Sathi, shut it down, we don't want it, we are backing Nokri. And they said, also change your auditors, we want a big five auditor. So, you know, we got on Pricewaterhouse as the auditor, and we went to our earlier auditors and said, listen guys, folks, I'm very sorry, but we have to part company, uh, you know, because, uh, we have taken this money and we have to, we are obliged to hire a big five auditor. Uh, so, tata bye bye. And they say, hey, no problem, because we were thinking of shutting our CA practice and starting a dot com anyway. <laughs> so, we said, cool, we'll give you a farewell gift. We'll give you Jeevan Sati. And, but we'll retain 45%. And you take 55%. And run it. So, they ran Jeevan Sati for four years. Uh, they couldn't raise money. Uh, they were doing a few lakhs of revenue every month. And, uh, at the end of four years, uh, you know, we were now making money. We were profitable. We had money piling up in the bank. Uh, and we said, what do we do with this money? And we said, why don't we buy Jeevan Sati back? So we went and bought Jeevan Sati back, the remaining 50%, and now we had a second vertical. Around 2005, I think, we said, hey, listen, uh, real estate is a big advertising category in print, real estate classifieds. Yep. Uh, there is no site, there was no site at that time, uh, other site. Why don't we launch a realistic classified site? Yep. Because Nokri was profitable in churning out cash. So the cash was accumulating on the balance sheet. And we said, let's put this cash to work. And that's how we got into Jeevan Sathi, uh, 99 acres, and then it continued. 2006 we listed, right? And, and we said, you know, uh, four verticals is enough. We can't really manage more than four internally. But the cash kept coming in. And we said, uh, why don't we invest in startups? And in 2007, we began to invest in startups. And uh, we've invested thus far in 100 startups, approximately, last 15 years. Uh, of which the two best known ones uh, are Zomato and Policy Bazaar. Yep. 
but there are others, including Exigo, which was on stage just earlier. Uh, so roughly 100 startups. So a big part of uh, Infoid now are, is also the startups we have invested behind. Got it, got it. And, and one question more, um, like many of these, some of these companies or the businesses like maybe started with a more web first approach like Nokri.com and, and some of them. So has the, has the overall the mobile revolution and mobile growth, consumer growth and user growth has kind of significantly expanded? Like how has been the transformation on more focus on mobile audi mobile? Uh, no, so it's huge. I mean, uh, I think seven, eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I think 93 or 94% of our traffic in Nokri came from uh, the big screen, laptop or desktop, right? Uh, today it's about 97% comes from mobile. 94% comes from mobile. It's in the mid 90s. That's quite something. Having said that, uh, a lot of our usage is enterprise usage where recruiters search the resume database for hiring. Yeah. And, much, and a lot of that usage happens on the bigger screen because it's done in office, it's done in working hours. Uh, to really see a resume properly, uh, you need a slightly larger screen. Uh, so, yeah. so, 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 you know, I guess different users use it differently. Right, but we had to adapt. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, and, and uh, in order to adapt, we had to get, uh, we had to learn stuff, we had to get more people. Yep. We've done that. And um, I think the next question I have is on, like you founded one of the early companies that went public and you also had an investor in Zomato, Policy Bazaar, which basically uh, also went public. And, and right now there are like good number of internet companies that have achieved scale. Uh, in India and are kind of looking to hit public markets whenever the markets are in a good shape uh, in the next few years, right? So markets and are in a good shape enough to take an IPO. It's just that uh, yeah. perhaps they are not at the valuations, the yeah, startup the valuations, valuations that they would get two years ago uh, when the market was really frothy. Uh, also, the appetite of uh, a lot of the investors to take a loss-making company yep. as an IPO uh, and give it the right, give it the valuation they were giving uh, two years ago, that may not be there. Yeah. So investors are a little bit more discerning today than they were two years ago, but you can go public if you're profitable and growing. So how should co companies think about preparing for it? Like in terms of, like over the next companies which are kind of working towards that uh, plan, how do they think about balancing so, growth, so profitability? I, 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 and I think, I think uh, so I'm not the expert, but uh, what happened to us was, uh, we went public in 2006. In 2005, beginning, uh, you know, we got a, there was a, you know, a bulge bracket investment banker, banking firm came to us and said, listen, uh, China's number one site has just gone public. We think India's number one job site can also go public. Right? And at that time, they said, listen, if you've got a 20 crore profit, 100 crore turnover, growing 30, 40% a year, the market will accept your stock. Now, that number may have changed now because the market has evolved. Maybe that number is 500 crores now. Maybe it is 300 crores now. I don't know. Bankers will tell you. Maybe the 20 crore profit number has to be 50 crores, 70 crores. I do not know. Right? But the bankers who are experts in this will tell you. Right? Uh, and I would recommend you don't go public if your company is not ready for it because it can be a huge issue for you to manage otherwise. Because, see, a, a, a public market listing is onerous. Uh, you come under a lot of scrutiny, whether from shareholders, investors, uh, analysts, or SEBI, yep. and other regulators. Uh, and therefore, you have to invest a lot in managing and servicing uh, a public market company. Right? And if you don't have the size and scale and profitability, that becomes a huge overhead, it becomes a distraction. Uh, so go public when you're ready and not before. Got it. So basically invest in the maturity of the organization if you, and first if you so, think so that you, you should. See, we began to prepare for the IPO in March 2005. It took us a year and a half to actually list the company. Yep. Right? During that time, what did we do? First of all, we said you need a very different capability in the finance function. So just a CFO and then a few junior people will not do. You need good next level management. So you need two, three senior people. 
you need a full-time company secretary. Uh, your auditors look at you differently if you're going to go public because the benchmarks for uh, governance, the benchmarks for you know what is true and fair accounting, all of that change. Uh, we had built our own ERP yep. for financial accounting and operations. Uh, you know, startups do that because you know passive you have to save money, yep. so we just built your own ERP. But the auditors, when you're going public, said, "Listen, uh, we can't work with your ERP." because we don't know what's under the hood, right? Because you built it, right? So if you've taken, if you got a one-year subscription to, from the client, how do I know that you are recognizing one twelfth of the, of the revenue of the collections every month yep. and not skewing it on this quarter or that quarter? Yeah. Uh, so we want you to migrate to a standard ERP from the market. That was a huge project. Yep. So all those things will happen. Right? Uh, so IPO readiness will require significant effort for most startups. Yep. Uh, very few are actually already doing that stuff. Yeah. Because you don't need to. Right? You have to restructure the board. You want more independent directors. You want an audit committee. Right? A board management becomes a challenge. Okay? So you have to do substantial capability building uh, in the stuff beyond business and growth in order to be ready to go public. <coughs> and so be so you have to be able to afford all that overhead and afford the management uh, bandwidth diversion. And Which means you need a good second line even in the business function. Got it, Sanjay. I think that's very helpful. And we have a good number of product and marketing teams in the audience today. Um, so how can they support the strategy uh, because, I mean, once you start thinking out of public, I mean, you have more constraints in terms of how much you can invest in, let's say, acquisition and how much you can do uh, things. Well, so. Uh, so, look, our company, we've never ever uh, had a profit target in a quarter. So, we've never ever curtailed expenditure uh, on anything because we are missing our profit targets. Right? Uh, we just do what we think is right for the business. Mm -hmm. And if the revenue happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. But we have the luxury of, uh, see, Nokri is negative working capital. We collect money 100% advance. It's 93% gross margin. Mm -hmm. So we have the luxury of being highly profitable. Yeah. So you can take these calls. A little bit of expenditure here or there doesn't matter. Because you'll still be highly, highly profitable. Uh, not all businesses have that kind of economics. Yeah. So you've got to do what's right for your company. Uh, and uh, you've got to do what's right for the business. Uh, and if you m don't make the profit that the street is expecting in a, in a particular quarter, it's okay. Got it, got it. And um, as, as one of the most experienced people in the India's startup ecosystem, what do you believe are some of the most significant opportunities and also challenges that we have in the startup ecosystem today? Um, and yeah. Look, I think uh, one of the things that happened uh, in the environment is that from around 2008 till about 2021, uh, every time the global economy, the US economy got into trouble, uh, the, the Fed would print more money. Yes. So there was a glut of liquidity, glut of cash, and this cash found its way all over the world and in all sorts of asset classes public markets, private markets, real estate, uh, you name it, there was a yep. asset price inflation. Uh, and yes, it did find its way into Indian startups. Uh, and several startups were quite happy raising more and more investor money rather than uh, getting profitable from operations because there was money available. Now, post-2021, we've had to make the adjustment, right? So I think a big risk is there will be some startups which will not be able to make the adjustment. Uh, low margins, high cost structures, uh, how do you make the adjustment? Got it. Right? Uh, you, you are spending money on growth, but that growth was not profitable. So it's a hell of a thing to say, you know, I won't do it 90%, I'll do it 10% on 
or I'm okay to contract the organization. Now, these are things that uh, people who have become entrepreneurs in the last 15 years are not used to doing and have not had to do. Uh, several are doing it well, but many are doing it well, some are not. Uh, you know, so that, according to me, is a big risk right now, that some will go under. Got it, got it. So basically, definitely um, get the economics right uh, of your business. Um, and also from the opportunity, opportunity standpoint, like how do you see the opportunities in the Indian startup so, ecosystem? So, no, no, there are, we are still seeing great companies come up. We are still seeing very good ideas. Uh, I think uh, we meet about a, a thousand startups and we, a quarter and we invest in two or three. Uh, I mean, some of the youngsters that I meet are really, really smart and they've got some great ideas. You know, we thought AI deep tech was some time away. Yep. And when we started a small AI deep tech fund two years ago, Mm -hmm. But right now, what we're seeing in AI and deep tech is, you know, AI is everywhere. There's huge opportunities there. Yep. Got it, got it. So, definitely more opportunity to leverage AI to kind of disrupt various categories. And, and finally, like, what advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs we have in the audience who are looking to build successful businesses in, in the startup and technology uh, Yeah, sector? I'll say a couple of things. I'll say, first thing is, uh, the customer's money is better than the investor's money. Yep. Okay. Sure. So if you're getting the customer's money and you're getting it uh, at a price that's higher than the cost, you're selling a product at a price that's higher than its cost, you know, chances are, and the customer's buying again and again, repeat business you're getting, yep. right? Chances are you have a potentially viable business so long as you can get enough customers. Yep. Right? Uh, and if you're getting the customer's money on these terms, the investor's money will almost certainly come. Because investors love to invest behind businesses that are getting customer money. On the other hand, if you get the investor's money first, right, uh, you know, uh, there is no guarantee that the customer's money will come. Because often the investor's money comes, early stage, you sold the idea well to the investor. Right? But the customer's money will only come if uh, there's product market fit. And that's a whole different ballgame, so very often. Yeah. So I would say focus on getting the customer's money. Investor will come after that. So focus on delivering real value to your customers and make money and, and drive repeat yes. customers. Absolutely. Uh, so definitely keep big takeaways. Um, I will open it up for a few questions, uh, Sanjeev. If sure. Yeah. If anyone has any question, if you can raise your hand. Uh, yep. Do we have mic. a mic? Yeah. They, they, can't, they can't hear you at the back, huh? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah sorry. So my question essentially was the entire setup of Info Edge, as you mentioned, is across different verticals, even Sati, Nokri, and so on. But that is not typically the structure that you see in startups, um, right? So what, what was the differentiation? What was the motivating factor to go ahead in such a way? You know, we were making money on Nokri. Uh, the money was accumulating. We said, what do we do? Should we give it back to shareholders? Or should we, the market opportunities out there? Uh, and in 2004, 5, 6, when we did all this, there, there weren't so many internet companies. These are all big, wide open spaces. So a little bit of capital, a little bit of know-how, uh, market opportunity, we said, let's do it. Now, would we do it today? Uh, may not be, because there's so much competition. Got it, and basically, you've seen the opportunity at the right time with those verticals, yeah. Yeah, we have someone here. Hello. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for the insights. Uh, for certain markets where, like, there are already big giants and it is, like, getting concentrated to monopolies or duopolies, like, uh, e-commerce is largely Flipkart and Amazon these days. Your search is largely Google these days. So if a company or an entrant wants to get into a space which is like uh, already there with a like very big uh, giants out there, what is your advice? For See, assess your capability and assess the nature of the market. 
if it's a winner-take-all market, right? Uh, and if you cannot meaningfully differentiate, okay, uh, to perhaps be a preferred option for customer, uh, and an established incumbent who has great technology and deep pockets, maybe you shouldn't enter. Hmm. Right? As simple as that. Now, can you launch a search engine that will compete with Google? I don't know how. Can you launch a professional networking site that will compete with LinkedIn? I don't know how. Can you launch a social networking site that will compete with Facebook? I don't know how. Right? But is there something you can do which is peculiarly Indian, which will cater to the Indian customer in some other vertical, in a niche? Uh, maybe. I don't have all the ideas, so I don't know, but maybe. So I think you will have to look for unsolved problems of prospective users and, and solve them. Right? Uh, and left be your probably original idea. Right? In order to do that. Got it. Got it. This one. All right. One last question. Yep. Can I ask a question? Okay. Yeah. I already yes, have the mic. Um, so, Sanjeev, a question to you. So, the path to profitability is often paved with hopefully good intention but bad execution in the India market. You've spoken very openly about governance, uh, independent directors, for founders to actually have this foresight to build uh, great governance when they're starting up. But what happens to existing companies? There are so many layoffs. Obviously, at this point in time, there are many unicorns which are going bust. What is your personal view on what can be done to revive uh, the startup sheen and entrepreneurship as it existed earlier? So look, startup uh, entrepreneurship is Darwinian. Okay, m many try, some succeed, uh, and many die. That's the nature of the beast. Right? Now, as a founder, as an entrepreneur, right, you've got to not give up, okay, and bounce back, maybe with the next company, in case this one goes bust. But, but, uh, is there something you can do to somehow break even? So if you're laying off people, look, it's painful, I know it is, uh, but will that enable survival of the company? So that earlier you had 300 people, now you have got 70 people, but with those 70 people, can you make a profit? If you can, maybe you'll bounce back. Right, uh, but if you have overhired, if you are overspending and need to cut cost, uh, in the short run and you don't have money, you may have to lay off people, and you know that's unfortunate, but that's a fact of life. Yes, it is. And, and Sanjeev, do you have any advice for VCs, venture investors? Uh, well, uh, look, I am, we are investing ourselves, so I would not. Uh, uh, you know, like to give a lecture to anybody, but I, I'll just say that what, what I tell our team, that invest slowly, uh, be discerning, don't be in a hurry. If the deal is not right, it's okay to walk away, don't have FOMO. Right? But that's what I tell our team. I would not say it to other investors. I'm nobody to tell them. Uh, but this is what I tell our team. Thank you, Sanjeev, and uh, thank, thanks for taking your time. I know we have, you have a very thank limited you. time, but thank you. really appreciate Thank you for calling me. Thank you so much with the biggest applause. And, and good luck, all of you. Uh, just to tell you that in the first five years of my career, uh, I spent three years in advertising and two years in marketing. So I'm not a techie, I'm a marketing guy. Yeah, have fun. <laughs>